Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm going to wait a few moments as folks continue to enter the room. Uh, while we're waiting, if you want to write into the chat box, let us know where you're from, where you're joining us from, maybe why you're here. We're going to get started shortly. All right. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. My name is Amelia. I'm a staff member with the New York State Chapter of NASW. Uh, really grateful to have all of our attendees here uh, and really grateful to have the Treatment Not Jail campaign here with us tonight. Um, this was a conversation that was brought to us by a student member uh, who is contributing to the campaign um, and just wanted to do a shout out. Uh, uh, to Michael and to any student member who would like to bring something to the association and, and to social workers in New York State and beyond. We um, really want to support the conversations that social workers want to have. So consider us, you know, a, a table or a stage. Um, and we love having uh, members contribute to, you know, what conversation should be happening. I'm quickly just going to do some administrative announcements and uh, hand it over to our presenters tonight. Uh, first thing I want to make sure that I mention is that this is not a CE program. I'll put a CE list of upcoming programs in the chat box um, when I'm done speaking. Just want to make it very clear that this is a place that we can provide resources to one another, have conversations with one another, hold space, but it's not a CE program. Um, I'm just going to mention a quick reminder to keep yourself muted while the presentations are going on. Uh, we want to cut down on that background noise and feel free to uh, make comments, ask questions in the chat box during the duration of the presentation. And of course, there'll be a time where we'd love to hear you unmute and ask a question or contribute a comment. Um, lastly, I'm just going to mention that uh, we have the uh, closed captions on your screen. You can click and drag and drop those closed captions anywhere on the screen if it is covering up the presentation. You can also click the carrot on the next to the CC and view the transcript on the right hand side of your screen or hide that closed captioning in general. Uh, now I'm going to hand it over to our presenters today. I'm going to hand it over to Marissa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amelia. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you again so much for joining us this evening for today's chapter chat. And today we'll be talking about Treatment Not Jail, a New York legislative coalition that's working to provide off ramps from the criminal justice system for New Yorkers who are experiencing substance use, mental health diagnoses, and other disabilities. And although this is a bill in New York State, its goals are pretty universally helpful and relevant. So we're excited to tell. Um, folks even out of state about how we how we built this. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself and then pass it off to my other presenters. My name again is Marissa and I'm a forensic social worker at the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem, one of several public defense organizations in New York City. I became involved in this coalition because so many of my clients experience contact with the justice system because they're dealing with untreated substance use or mental health challenges. And this bill would benefit so, so many of my clients. Um, I will pass it to Pamela. Thanks, Marissa. Hello, everyone. My name is Pamela Herrera and my pronouns are she, her, and ella. I'm a policy and advocacy coordinator for Woodside on the Move and a program coordinator for the Western Queens Community Land Trust. Both organizations are in Queens, New York. Um, Woodside on the Move is a 47 year old nonprofit grassroots organization that supports coalition like Treatment Not Jail to advocate for the community and the state of New York. As a grassroots organization, our base are those who have experienced barriers and neglect in New York and who want to be part of the change. And I'm gonna pass it over to Michael. Thank you. My name is Michael Gallopo, pronouns he, him, his, and I am an intern with the Urban Survivors Union, which is a national advocacy organization comprised of people who have been directly and adversely impacted by the drug war. Uh, and uh, my interest in the, in the campaign, for one, is, you know, because I am a person who is a graduate of a diversionary court program, so I've been uh, directly impacted as well as I've spent several years working directly here in New York State in support of a drug court program um, in our local government unit and our, our behavioral and community health department. Um, so based on my experiences there, there were 
a number of, of areas where we had identified there could be some improvement and Treatment Not Jail was a, a, a campaign that uh, offered a lot of really practical solutions to address some of the ethical dilemmas that we had we had identified. And with that all, I'll pass it off to uh, Andrea Nieves. Hi everyone, my name is Andrea Nieves, uh, she, her pronouns. I'm a senior policy attorney at New York County Defender Services, which is a different public defender office in Manhattan other than the one Marissa works at. Um, I'm actually an attorney, not a social worker. So thank you very much for inviting me into your space and allowing me to participate. I've been with the Treatment Not Jail Coalition since its inception in 2020. Um, so I'm really excited to share about how the campaign came about and um, you know why, why it's so crucial for social workers and other folks who care about these issues to get involved in law reform in your own communities. So thanks so much. So just to do a brief overview of what we're going to talk about today, uh, we're going to go over and uh, hopefully get some familiarity with how diversion courts work here in New York State, um, just to kind of give you all just a baseline for a side-by-side -side comparison with some of what you might be seeing in your area. Uh, we're also going to discuss why the status quo for these programs is inconsistent with the values and principles of social work practice, um, and specifically referencing the, the areas of the NASW Code of Ethics that, that we feel are the most directly impacted. And we're also gonna learn how the Treatment Not Jail Act that we've created here can help to improve uh, client outcomes. Uh, and then we're gonna also discuss just briefly towards the end um, some strategies, since we do have a, a, a kind of a diverse stakeholdership from around the country, how you can uh, start to build these diverse coalitions and what we did here, maybe as a, an opportunity to do some modeling and think about you know, what this could look like in your area, followed by a brief you know, period of question and answer at the end. So just, just a few kind of things to understand as a, as a baseline to kind of enter into the conversation. Um, when we're talking about um, diversionary programs or um, alternatives to incarceration, um, you know, also have been called drug courts or treatment courts. Um, and this is um, something that somebody is able to opt into based on a set of eligibility criteria uh, instead of serving time or receiving a sentence to go to prison. Um, usually these are done in, in specialized courts that are staffed by um, you know special judges and attorneys that um, specialize in handling ATIs um, and typically they're done along lines of uh, you know qualifying membership criteria whether it's substance use, uh, mental illness, um, different types of qualifying uh, disabilities, and we often see them with uh, veterans courts as well. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, when we talk about these courts, you know, here in New York, we call the, the prosecutorial attorneys district attorneys or DAs. Um, so that's just a term that we use here. Um, and so every county kind of independently elects their DA, so that's done through a democratic process here. And essentially, they're the ones who are the gatekeepers to all of the, the mental health courts here across New York State. And so, you know, some of what we've done is try to revise the procedural justice that's associated with how people enter into these programs and what that looks like. And just to kind of give you all an understanding of the urgency and, and the importance of this, right now we're spending over half a million dollars a year per person to hold them in incarceration. And this is a major issue. I mean, just imagine if we invested a fraction of those resources in actually providing direct services and social supports in our community. And so we really need to think about what is the best use of our limited resources and how are we gonna produce the outcomes that we're looking for? And so just to kind of like paint a little bit of context to help understand like how this looks like in practice or how this might impact somebody, I'll share a little bit about my story. So. I'm somebody who's in long-term recovery from a substance use disorder. Um, and I came into contact with the justice system. In fact, the first time I came into contact with the justice system, I was given an evaluation for diversionary drug court. And at the time they found that I wasn't eligible because they didn't consider my substance use to be primary 
because I had other co-occurring health conditions that involved pain management. A lot of the, the medications that I was struggling with were medications that were prescribed and they were being prescribed for other qualifying diagnoses. So because the substance use wasn't primary, I was not considered to be eligible for diversion, even though the, the, the entirety of my charges was centered around drug possession and I probably would not have come into contact with the justice system um, had I not been struggling with the substance use issue. So I really clearly would have benefited from the program, but I did not meet the strict eligibility criteria. So instead I ended up serving time in prison. When I got out of prison, my girlfriend died suddenly, like within a year of me getting out of prison. And in light of the trauma that I'd experienced, um, I had a recurrence of symptoms. And nothing that I had received while I was incarcerated really prepared me for how to address my substance use disorder, mental health. And so I was ill-equipped to be successful in community release. Uh, so I wound up back in front of the justice system. This time around, because I had already served time for substance use, this shifted the priority or the severity of the substance use disorder, which allowed me to qualify. And so I finally went into the program had a lot of back and forth struggles with doctors. Um, they could not get my medications right. They weren't allowed to prescribe me certain medications that were needed for my autoimmune disease. And so by the end of that year, it was the drug court doctor that actually placed me back into the state's medical cannabis program because it was the only medication that could effectively alleviate my autoimmune disease. And so out of medical necessity, I was placed back in the program. I completed that program successfully. I had no sanctions against me. I had no relapse, no recurrence. Uh, I worked through all of the issues that I needed to work through with support. Um, however, it took a really long time for me to get engaged in that program. In fact, it took about two and a half years for me to get into that program. I also had to take a plea of guilt to a bunch of felonies that are now still to this day on my record. And those stand as a major barrier for me to employment, to education, to other benefits, including housing or food stamps. And this will follow me for the rest of my life, right? So just for the act of accepting help to address my issues that were related to substance use. I had no victims of any crime. I had never you know, stolen from anybody. I never hurt anybody. They were literally just drug possession crimes. And because I wanted to accept help, here I am now, almost you know, a full decade later, still paying the price for that. And very fortunate for me, this happened in the state of Connecticut that has a pretty extensive pardoning system. And so I will if, if, you know, be able to actually get those charges removed uh, from my record. However, had that happened here in New York or almost any other state in the country, I would never be able to get those charges removed from my record. And so this circumvents due process. There's a lot of reasons why that this is an issue, um, the way charging decisions are handled by prosecutors and how upcharging is a common practice to secure plea bargains. Um, there's a variety of social justice issues. And of course, people from communities of color and from vulnerable populations are disproportionately impacted by these issues. So these are major social justice implications. Um, so I'm not gonna get any, any further in, in detail other than that. Uh, because I want to turn this over, you know, to to the rest of our panel here to kind of go over some of these these issues in more detail and kind of spell these out. But just wanted to give you a sense, an overview of how this can very severely impact somebody's life in an irrevocable fashion and how people are categorically denied on a class basis from benefiting from these programs, even if they are um, willing and able to participate and benefit from these programs. Yeah, and like Michael, there are thousands of people still going through the struggles of our prison system, and so good outcomes are difficult to impossible for people leaving incarceration, as evidenced by the overwhelming prevalence of homelessness, unemployment, poverty, and recidivism make it an uphill battle. Leaving prison should mean having a fresh start, but for most returning citizens, it presents even greater challenges. The United States releases over 7 million people from jail and more than 600,000 people from prison each year, which leads to every two out of three people being rearrested and more than 50% incarcerated again. Unfortunately, the rate of recidivism in the United States is 70% within five years of release. And in New York, our rates of recidivism reflect national trends and are unacceptably disturbing. 
with an estimated 45% of all parolees in New York City experiencing a rearrest within two years. For people with mental illness, incarceration brings about even worse outcomes. In New York City, these individuals return to jail nearly twice as fast as those charged with similar crimes, but who do not have mental illnesses. Those diagnosed with psychiatric disorders such as alcohol and drug use disorders, personality dis disorders, attention deficit hyperactivity disorders, or schizophrenia disorders face a higher risk of reoffending and committing violent offenses upon release than those without diagnosis. And as Michael's story, I think really poignantly illustrates, Treatment courts may have been developed with good intentions, but their current operation is deeply flawed. I'm going to go over some of the current practices in New York State diversion courts, commonly seen issues, and think about the NASW code of ethics and how these practices might fail as they stand now to align with them. First, diversion courts are highly coercive and often require participants to plead guilty as a condition of even getting the opportunity to access treatment. This puts them on the hook for incarceration if there's any non-compliance with their treatment court mandate. This might require negative toxicology tests or specific attendance rates at therapy and more. This is troubling because treatment courts are often more punitive than they are therapeutic. Treatment decisions are often informed by judges and attorneys who aren't qualified to provide mental health care or substance use um, treatment or any other form of treatment. And the intensity of a person's treatment plan might be based on the severity of their legal charge and not their actual health needs. These decisions are further limited once they're written into a legal or judicial contract because treatment providers have little flexibility to change courses of treatment based on the client's evolving needs. Practitioners in drug court treatment systems are routinely presented with ethical dilemmas when drug courts might demand treatment that is in conflict with clinical guidance. All in all, this illustrates a fairly regressive view about substance use disorder, mental health, and other disabilities. Um, it's not very therapeutic to have a policy, for example, where relapse, a common occurrence in a person's recovery journey, makes someone fail out of diversion court and land themselves in prison. Because treatment is often guided by legal context instead of clinical need, many participants also get inadequate treatment. Mental health is sometimes deprioritized and less understood by the courts with a larger focus on substance use disorder alone. And in other situations, participants may end up being overtreated with destabilizing effects. I've seen district attorneys demand that clients engage in long-term residential treatment in order to access diversion court, even if the clinical value of that service was questionable. We should be directing people to services in the least restrictive setting necessary. That's therapeutically sound and also a key principle in disability justice. As of now, diversion courts are not abiding by that principle. So Treatment Not Jail offers a critical pathway for reforming judicial diversion programs. Existing programs, as we just outlined, cause numerous ethical dilemmas for social workers and can lead to professional burnout. Um, next, we're going to go through an overview of the primary reforms that Treatment Not Jail is trying to achieve and then go into some specific examples of how they would help diversion and treatment courts come into better alignment with NASW ethics. So as Marissa and Pamela outlined in Michael Tudor's story, like there's just so many problems with our existing treatment courts. And so in New York State, we decided to come together, all, you know, directly impacted folks, folks who work at grassroots organizations like Pamela, public defenders, social workers. We have a huge coalition. We're going to speak more about that coalition. And we decided to draft legislation. We decided the existing law doesn't work. So we're going to draft new legislation, new laws um, that will, you know, put us in line with the NS NASW code of ethics and really just embrace best practices. Um, and so just kind of an overview of what the legislation that we've drafted would do. First of all, it dramatically expands access to statutory diversion courts. 
Um, it also creates new programs in areas where such programs are lacking. Right now, only 50% of New York counties have a mental health treatment court. Um, we would ensure that we have those programs in every county. Uh, we also center the client and their treatment team, which I think is, is huge and really overdue and not something that we see in any of these courts across the country. And we think this is so important because it's gonna reduce or eliminate criminal records to limit the expansion of racial inequities. For us, this is not just about you know, helping people who have who are struggling with mental health issues. This is really a racial justice issue. Um, this is an equity issue. Um, and so for us, overhauling our existing system is really crucial. Next slide. And um, the way that we do that in large part is by amending the charge-based eligibility. And so what I mean by that is right now, right now we only have statutory drug courts in New York state. What that means is we passed a law back in 2009 that said every county will have a drug court and this is what they look like. And what the law says now is that if you're charged with, you know, this kind of drug possession um, or this low level drug sale, then you can participate in drug court. Um, and, and that's what governs, you know, our drug courts right now. And we don't have statutory mental health courts. Instead, what we do is we say, look, we have drug courts in every county. Let's make those courts treatment courts. And let's ensure that, um, you know, folks with mental health issues can also come into the courts. Um, and so, like, how do we do that? What, what does that look like um, for under the Treatment Not Jail Act, eligibility is going to be based on need. So it's not based on, you know, whether or not you are charged with selling, you know, marijuana. Instead, you have to have one, the existence of a functional impairment, which for us is a substance use disorder, a mental health issue, but also includes disabilities, personality disorders, um, traumatic brain injuries. You know, is, is there a problem? first of all, right, a functional impairment. And second, is that health issue, right, this functional impairment related to a person's involvement in the criminal legal system? So just because you have a health issue doesn't mean that that's necessarily has a nexus to the crime that you're um, accused of. But in our experience, so many people, I mean, that that's why they're there, right? It's because they were dealing with, they were in the midst of a mental health crisis and that's when the police got involved and that's how it escalated to become um, a criminal charge. The third thing that the courts would have to look at is whether it's a health issue that can be treated, right? Um, and so in our experience, many, many mental health issues can be treated safely and effectively in the community and in fact, all the evidence shows that they can't effectively be treated in jail or prison settings. Um, but that's one of the things that the judge has to look at. Is there a health issue that can be treated? And finally, you know, is treatment in the best interest of the client and the public? That's really crucial for us as well. Um, you know, that, that's the assessment that we require the judge to make. And, and a huge piece of this, and I think Michael alluded to this, we've removed the requirement that people plead guilty in order to receive treatment. So right now, Marissa mentioned this as well, you have to plead guilty in order to even have the possibility to access treatment. And not only do you have to plead guilty, you have to plead guilty to the top charge. So that means if you're charged with a felony and three misdemeanors, and in most cases, that felony would get knocked down and you would eventually plead to the misdemeanor if you just stayed in regular court. The way our courts work right now is that you have to plead guilty to that felony in order to access treatment. And then that treatment can be very coercive, et cetera, et cetera. We remove the requirement that people plead guilty. So we're going to speak about each of these issues a little bit more throughout the presentation, and we're going to tie them to uh, the NASW Code of Ethics, but that's kind of the broad overview of the legislation. Okay, next slide. Thank you. Um, the NASW Code of Ethics compels us as social workers to not just abide by the ethical principles in our individual work, but also make active efforts to resolve any ethical conflicts that we see in our agencies or relevant laws and regulations. As you've heard, there is the current state of judicial diversion is ripe for reform, which is part of the reason why 
uh, social workers on the panel especially were so drawn to treatment not jail and the reforms that they're pushing. And just as a grounding, one of our core values of social justice is certainly relevant here broadly. As we've mentioned, the criminal legal system is a source of considerable injustice right now, and we're tasked with challenging it and working on behalf of vulnerable populations like those who are trying to access treatment courts. So according to a 2020 data from New York State court officials, there are only 30 mental health courts in the state. They served a total of 140 participants statewide, and only 50% of counties in New York have a mental health court. The number of people served by mental health treatment courts statewide are abysmal, and only about half of New York counties even have such a court and access to diversion courts is limited and largely depends on your geographical area. Even then, relatively few people are served. And as Andrea mentioned, diversion courts often refuse to accept people with specific diagnoses, such as these five on the slide. This leaves out a huge portion of people who have mental health challenges and could benefit from treatment as an alternative to prison. And going back to the code of ethics, as Marissa stated, code of ethics can assist you in any field you're determined to work in and help you recognize your alignment with an organization, coalition, relationship, and an employer. As social workers, we must not discriminate against anyone and understand their background and their upbringing. We must also uphold and advance the values, ethics, knowledge, and mission of the profession. As social workers, we protect and improve the lives of others in our fields with these codes. The passage of the Treatment Not Jail Act will help reduce discrimination based on mental and physical ability. And currently in Manhattan, um, it takes 331 days for people to enter mental health courts. And let's face it, even letting a day go by to have treatment is damaging to these individuals in our community. Even those accepted in courts statewide face a wait time to begin treatment during which they will sit and wait in jails. And it is imperative that we research to know the best measures to brainstorm and potentially influence our elected officials with. Social workers should monitor and evaluate policies, the implementation of programs and practice interventions. Social workers engage in evaluation of research to protect participants from unwarranted physical or mental distress, harm, danger, or deprivation. By following this code, we will eliminate uncertainty and promote the well-being of all. Thank you. Um, going back to the pre-plea model for a moment, um, Treatment at Jail seeks to expedite access to treatment and ensure that people don't languish in jail for months or even years while waiting for their cases to resolve with the plea. Offering treatment without requiring that upfront plea of guilt addresses the coercive nature of plea bargaining and acknowledges that many people, particularly low income people and folks of color, often plead guilty to crimes simply because they cannot afford bail. TNJ's model would prevent people from feeling forced to give up their legal rights to a trial in order to access health care. Also, for non-citizens, the mere admission to a criminal charge in a plea could result in deportation, regardless of whether the case is ultimately dismissed after their successful completion or graduation from diversion court. And criminal convictions, as I'm sure many in the audience know, can cause huge barriers to employment, licensing, housing, education, the very factors that can offer stability and support that people often need to stay out of the legal system. Um, next, thank you. Um, Treatment Not Jail proposes the removal of that plea requirement, which strengthens clients' right to self-determination and choice, which is one of our ethical standards. This is align in alignment with our requirement to promote client self-determination. And for social workers who work amongst other professionals, judges and attorneys, for example, it's imperative that we weigh in on these issues. 
They absolutely impact the well being of our clients and their access to care. And we should bring our unique social work lens and perspective into conversations about how to make systems work better for our clients. Interdisciplinary collaboration. And related to the previous ethical standards, social workers should not allow policies or procedures to interfere with their ethical practice of social work. For me personally, I consistently bump up against situations where court policy or district attorney expectations are compelling me to encourage my clients to seek out treatment to resolve their case, even if that treatment is not necessarily clinically appropriate. Treatment Not Jail would put treatment decision-making into the rightful hands of treatment providers who are specialized, professionally trained, and their clients, not just with judges and attorneys. So what does the TNJ Act do? Um, the Treatment Not Jail Act removes incarceration as default punishment for noncompliance, which essentially helps people have stability in their lives when they've when they've messed up. It also expedites processing times for those undergoing eligibility screening and awaiting placement. This is mainly accomplished by eliminating the plea requirement. Now anyone can request screening anytime after the person first goes to court. And, and so it's important for us to also kind of consider you know, how under the, the ethical principle of social welfare, that social workers should advocate for living conditions that are conducive to the fulfillment of basic human needs and should promote social, economic, political, and cultural values and in institutions that are compatible with the realization of social justice. And the honest truth, the frank honest truth, having spent years working within the diversionary court system as it exists now, and having been directly impacted as a graduate of that system, the system as it exists now is not compatible with the values of social justice. And it's expanding the reach of mass incarceration and how the label of criminality continues to be carried by an ever increasing number of people, which has an intergenerational impact. It impacts upward mobility, it impacts you know, parents' ability to receive higher education or funding for school, which in turn has an effect on their children and it, it compounds generational trauma. And so we need to move away and consider how we can use these opportunities to create critical off ramps from the criminal legal system. And so what does TMJ do uh, in terms of aligning us with our, with our ethics? Well, it allows us to incorporate uh, proven effective harm reduction principles and strategies. You know, I've had to bury multiple participants from our program just in the last several years who died while in supervised care from preventable overdose. And the lack of access to naloxone, the lack of access to responsible consumer education, and in some cases, some programs, uh, diversion core programs, are not even allowing their participants to, to receive certain types of pharmacotherapy or medical maintenance for substance use disorder. And so there are some serious implications in terms of um, people being able to access evidence-based treatment. Um, it also encourages the use of the least restrictive setting, again, in alignment with what Marissa was um, sharing with us about the disability rights, um, justice and, and movement and their principles. Um, and it allows for more individualized forms of programming um, during the court mandate by also removing the requirement of a court approved entity. And so anybody who's potentially already working in a, in a clinical treatment team with an individual who comes into contact with the justice system, that that person would not be required to turn over care to another provider, you know, provided that they're you know, already a qualified health professional that has an established clinical relationship with that individual that could be a part of the treatment planning and process that, that's already in place. So it would eliminate some of the inconsistencies in terms of how treatment is being provided. Um, it also incorporates procedural justice principles. Again, by eliminating the plea, plea bargain, you know, we're able to allow people to maintain their rights to due process throughout. That means they, they can't just ar be arbitrarily sanctioned for noncompliance. There has to be a process where the, uh, the evidence or the complaint that's being presented against them 
uh, is provided, that they're given a reasonable notice of what's being made as a complaint. They'll have an opportunity to prepare a defense. And if at any time they feel that the program isn't serving them or they're not benefiting from treatment or they no longer want to participate, they still have the option to go back through the traditional judicial process, which is what we believe in here in the United States, right? Is that we believe in a fair justice system and a fair justice process where people are able to have their case represented in a court of law and they're not being forced to forfeit their rights in order to seek help through treatment. And so what this allows to happen is that the treatment decisions are placed squarely in the hands of healthcare professionals, not legal professionals, which is where it belongs. That's ethical practice. And so the benefits of a harm reduction approach involve collaborative treatment planning here in New York State, OASIS, which is our, our single state agency for substance use services, um, has a mandate that uh, actually requires providers to uh, offer person-centered treatment. Uh, right now, the current model of drug court does not allow for that. Um, and so what we're asking is to have our programs aligned with the best practices of our state provider association and our state single state agency. Um, and so this would resolve some really hairy ethical dilemmas for practitioners that are currently working in these environments statewide. Um, and this allows for us to be provide better trauma-informed care, uh, to emphasize therapeutic goals and therapeutic outcomes over punitive measures uh, for noncompliance. It allows us to incorporate overdose prevention into the, into the program. Um, and then also the uh, holistic view of recovery. So recovery isn't a process where people just simply abstain from using substances right away, right? We know in mental illness, oftentimes it takes time for people to stabilize on new medications, or sometimes they may need to try multiple different medications to find the right formula and pharmacotherapy. So it's typical in a course of recovery for people to experience both gains and setbacks and in incorporating harm reduction principles to, for us to be able to plan for that backwards movement, right? And to be able to continue to develop that therapeutic alliance and to work with them in stage appropriate ways to produce change, right? And so this would allow us to be able to do that inside of diversion court. And then finally, social and political action. So social workers you know, are compelled to engage in social and political action that seeks to ensure that all the people that we serve have equal access to the resources, employment, services, and opportunities that they require to meet their basic human needs and to develop fully. And those are severely impacted, particularly by the plea requirement and the long lasting effect of having criminal records. Uh, social workers also must act to expand choice and opportunity for all people with special regard for vulnerable, disadvantaged, oppressed, and exploited people in groups, the very people that we're talking about serving through the lens of these diversionary court programs. And so social workers should promote policies and practices that also demonstrate a respect for difference, as well as promote policies that safeguard the rights and, and confirm equity and social justice for all people. And that's what we're talking about today. You know, we must change these programs so that way people are not being denied their access on the basis of their mental or physical ability or their immigration status. And right now, as these programs exist today, they are being denied wholesale on a class basis. This is not only injustice, but it should not be allowed. This is a violation of the basic constitutional principles of the United States and numerous federal policies that prevent such discrimination from existing. And so finally, because of all of these restrictions of the existing program, you know, of the 15,000 people that were detained in 2021, only just over 400 of them were eligible for diversion under the current law. And according to a recent Barry Institute analysis with the revisions that we proposed, more than half of those people would have been eligible uh, for, for access to these programs, which means they would be living with their families in the community and receiving help that they need, that they are not receiving while incarcerated and being additionally traumatized and subjected to potentially very violent and dangerous circumstances, especially with COVID-19 circulating our prisons. 
you know, we have to consider the health implications of our prisoners. And, and so while treatment courts not only improve outcomes, allow us to introduce evidence-based practices that are supported by rigorous research, they also save us enormous amounts of money and they reduce recidivism. So what our court office of administration estimated was that for every dollar invested in treatment court, the state would save at least $2.21. And so this would allow us to continue to have funding to invest in these programs ongoing. And, and this is important when we talk about sustainability. So creating these critical offerings actually gives us more money that we can reinvest in critical social supports for our communities. Andrea? Thanks. Um, so now I'll speak a little bit about um, kind of the legislative process and um, how we built out this coalition. So the Treatment Not Jail Act is proposed legislation in New York State. It has not passed yet. Uh, the campaign started in 2020. Um, and since that time, you know, over the last two years, two and a half years, we have built a really robust coalition of folks who are supporting this legislation and asking the legislature to enact it. And we actually came pretty pretty close to um, having it passed as part of the budget this year. It didn't happen, so we're gonna keep fighting, we're gonna keep building our coalition, we're gonna keep talking to folks, but um, these are some of the logos, just of some of the groups that support us. You can see we have a lot of public defenders like the Legal Aid Society, the Bronx Defenders. We have grassroots groups like Woodside on the Move, New Hour for Women and Children, Long Island. Um, we have service providers, which include the Fortune Society, Exodus, and Cases. They all run different, you know, ATIs and um, house, provide housing for folks who are um, leaving the criminal legal system. We have mental health advocacy advocacy groups like uh, NAMI, the National uh, Alliance on Mental Illness. We have the New York State Association of Psychiatric Rehabilitation Services, which uh, represents a lot of the folks who provide like in, inpatient services. And we also have professional associations. So the New York State NASW chapter has signed on in support of the Treatment Not Jail campaign. So we're really grateful uh, to our New York friends for your support and the New York State Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. You'll also see like the Long Island Council of Churches. Um, we just, we have folks from all across, all across the state who are joining together to fight for this reform. Um, and I'm going to speak now about our legislative sponsors because that's really crucial um, and any state is selecting the sponsors of your legislation because you really want to find people who are going to fight for the change that you're seeking. And as you can tell from our presentation, we are seeking, I mean, a complete overhaul of the existing system. If any of you are forensic social workers or you know, work with the courts or work with drug treatment um, in your state or, or just have personal experience, you may see that what we are proposing is very, very different from the status quo. Um, and so we're, we are really lucky to have found sponsors who are willing to go to bat and help us fight for these kind of really, really massive changes to the existing system. As you can tell uh, from her photo, our sponsor in the state assembly, we have a, a two house system in New York state. We have both the assembly and the state Senate. It has to pass through both houses and get the governor's signature in order to become law. Assembly member Farah Soufrant Forrest is a nurse. Um, so she really understands this bill and she was immediately supportive when she learned about it because she works with folks um, in the hospital system and realizes how broken that system is in serving folks and how many of those folks are just pushed into our jails and prisons. Uh, Rikers is the largest um, mental health facility in the country. That's a problem. Uh, Senator Jessica Ramos is from Queens. I think her district is one of the most diverse districts in the entire country um, in terms of language diversity. Um, and so she, she represents folks who are directly impacted by this. Um, and so we were really, really lucky to find those legislative sponsors um, to help us, we hope in the next few years, bring this piece of legislation across the finish line. 
Um, and so we hope that this conversation, we can go to the next slide now, will spur you to think about um, how you can create change in your own community. All of you have a plethora of life and professional experiences, and you may be witnessing similar injustices to what we're seeing in our drug and mental health treatment courts in New York State. And so we would really urge you to think about whether something like the TNJ Act is something that might make sense in your community. Um, so we just pose a couple of questions here for you to think about. What does judicial diversion look like in your community? What are the system's strengths and weaknesses? Um, if you see some weaknesses that you think could be addressed through legislation or local policy, um, who are your local stakeholders? What is the messaging that might be most effective? And what are some of the barriers to passing um, a piece of legislation like TNJ in your state? You know, a lot of times you don't have to pass a law to create change. Um, we see a lot of pilot projects start up organically in New York State um, that allow for real change in, in specific communities. Um, you know, for example, we've talked a lot about this pre-plea model, right? Not requiring somebody to plead guilty in order to access treatment. That's actually based on our opioid courts in New York State. So New York State has something like eight opioid courts. They're mostly based in upstate counties. And I'll be honest, they're mostly based in counties that are majority white counties all of the opioid courts have adopted a pre-plea model. And so what that means is the folks who want to engage in opioid courts don't have to wait 331 days to access treatment while they're incarcerated like you do in mental health treatment courts. Uh, we talked to some service providers in Syracuse. Syracuse has an opioid court, which serves mostly white people. And they also have a mental health treatment court, which serves mostly black people. The black people who um, are trying to access treatment through the mental health court often have to wait up to a year and plead guilty up front to a felony in order to access treatment. The white folks who go through the opioid court, it's basically the same courtroom, but different days. Um, they don't have to plead guilty. As soon as they come into the jail, they're able to start accessing treatment and are able to get released back into the community where they can get that treatment while their case is pending. Um, and so that model already exists in New York State. And we think that that, should, that model should be available to everybody. Um, and certainly that raises some, some racial justice concerns there. So when, once we saw that, we said, okay, we gotta do something about this. Um, so we hope that you'll start to have those conversations in your own community. And as you can see here, you know, the social workers have really been leaders in our campaign. And so we hope that some of you will start to think about how you can uh, create change in your own community. Um, and so from there, we're gonna open it up to Q and A. Um, I'm sure many of you have questions about our legislation or maybe how you could enact this in your own communities. We're here to answer any of your questions. So please, please go ahead. Yeah, and feel free to raise your hand as well or just jump in. Hi, this is Nydia from upstate New York, Montgomery County. Hi, Nydia. Hi, and uh, Michael knows my frustrations with the opiate I'm a drug court graduate uh, from uh, 19 and a half years ago. And um, I have to tell you what I see today is not what I saw happen when I was in drug court, but the opiate court system. I have individuals sitting right now in Montgomery County withdrawing from opiates. And uh, the service thought is if they've been there three to five days, there's no need for them to be um, in treatment because they've already withdrawn from the opiates. Um, I was a peer advocate for opiate court and um, somehow or another they lost the funding. So I was only there a year, but every time I made calls to the district, well not the district attorney to the drug court coordinator or the uh, coordinator in charge of treatment that was being provided by uh, Liberty Partnership, which is kind of a park, 
there was no beds. Uh, we can't get them there. Uh, it, it was always something. So I think in a year I got to get three people through the system. And then, and then if they were Hispanic and couldn't speak the language, they weren't going anywhere. Right now, I have to send individuals from Montgomery County, Amsterdam, New York to Brooklyn for treatment because providers do not have access, because individuals do not have access here. I have had individuals sent back from Cornerstone because they do not have anyone that can serve, you know, help them in treatment. So um, I've been asking uh, everyone, I'm actually on the board of For New York and um, we're forming a, a group of us to speak to Oasis, speak to the commissioner because, um, Oasis says that, well, they gave me a booklet full of uh, names and places to call. And I identified three places and none of them are upstate. They're either in Rochester, excuse me, New York City or Syracuse. We live in Amsterdam. Either way is three and a half hours. Then we run into the problem of how are they going to get there? Who's going to pay for that? So yeah, I'm pretty frustrated with the system. I'm pretty frustrated with the way things are working now. Um, and so it's time to blow the whistle. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Nydia. I mean, I, I think you just illustrate so perfectly why the system is broken and how ripe it is for reform, right? Creating these courts in every single county is crucial. Another thing that we do in this bill that I didn't mention is we create um, a transfer mechanism. So for example, sometimes people get arrested in a county that they don't live in. Um, right. Or, right, they, they live in their home county, they're already getting services, they're connected to services in their home county. And right now, if you're arrested in this other county, you have to, like, access treatment through that county, you can create, like, a transfer mechanism. So if somebody can actually get a bed in Brooklyn, we would be able to transfer the case to Brooklyn so that they could resolve the case there, which is actually an, a mechanism that already exists for veterans treatment courts. Um, so it should exist for mental health treatment as well. So, but thank you for, for flagging that for us because um, this is, I mean, it's just broken like top to bottom. Uh, Vanessa, I saw you had a hand raised. Yes, thank you. This is a question for you, really, Andrea, as a lawyer. My concern is that public defenders and defense lawyers may not be on board with this, that they need more information, maybe, or more training, or you know, just more thrust in terms of pursuing this. That's a great question. Actually, we wrote the bill. <laughs> So, um, and we do have the, um, we do have the support of public defenders in our state, all of the public defender and even like private bar have come out in support of this bill. Um, I think in part because we already have statutory drug courts. And so this just expands on the existing statutory drug courts. So in many ways, it feels familiar to practice to practitioners, you know, we're not totally, uh, Re rewriting, you know, the, the whole statutory system. We're just saying, hey, we already have drug courts in every county. Let's just see all the people who need treatment in these courts. And instead of calling them drug courts, let's call them treatment courts. And let's address people holistically. So we've been really lucky to, um, you know, have public defenders involved in this conversation from the very beginning. I would actually say that, um, one, the judiciary has been a big problem. Obviously, judges don't like change in many cases. Um, I think there are individual judges who are interested and obviously individual judge, judges who are running really successful mental health courts in some counties in New York. Um, but um, I, I would say, you know, the main, the main reason we haven't been able to get it passed so far is political. Simply, you know, crime is rising, blood in the streets, we can't do anything to, to help folks who are, um, you know, th there's a real reluctance to engage in criminal legal system reform this year and the election year. So, so that was really what we came up against this year. Thank you. 
And I saw a couple of uh, comments in the chat. I don't know. Um, I want to make sure we get to all of them. Um, Feel free to jump right in. There's a I, there's a question in there from Julia. Um, saying that in North Carolina, there is a Chief's Justice Task Force on, force on ACEs informed courts. Uh, does New York have something similar? If not, are there judges who would be interested in engaging in trauma informed training or supporting this act? So the problem we've come up with the, with the judiciary in New York State is that traditionally the judiciary doesn't weigh in on bills that they didn't draft themselves publicly. So what that means is they, they don't come out and support something that is not a bill that they drafted. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't weigh in privately with legislators who they may um, have, a, have a relationship with. Um, but certainly there are some individual judges who are already engaged in trauma-informed training, um, but it's not you know, widespread. And I think, um, you know, that it's certainly been a challenge to engage with uh, judges, because even if we're able to engage with an individual judge, for example, who, who runs a court that uh, works really well, and we talk to them about the bill, they may say, you know, off the record, I'm supportive, but it's up to the chief judge to set the policy for the entire state. So that's, that's something we've been um, coming across. Um, and, and just the politics of the judiciary in New York um, are such that um, I can't imagine if the chief judge put together a task force on treatment courts that, that any proposal that they supported or put forth would look like treatment not jail, just based on my experience with um, the kind of proposals that they traditionally put forth. So I have a question. Is there is is harm reduction part of the policy of the treatment courts? So let me say why I, I asked that. Um, in our treatment court here in Montgomery County, there's several individuals that came into drug court with a marijuana card and they have been incarcerated and or thrown off the treatment court because they refuse uh, to they refuse to stop their medication. Yes, so that would be squarely addressed. In fact, abstinence would no longer serve as a central requirement and it would not be a determinant of success in terms of the, the parameters of this program. What is a determinant of success is the person, you know, working with their provider towards accomplishing their self-directed goals of their individualized treatment plan. And that treatment plan can incorporate goals that do not include to total abstinence. And, and so, so long as that person is making efforts. Um, the other thing too, is that if the treatment is found to be unsuccessful, it changes the presumption that there's a problem with the individual to there being a, an inappropriate intervention. And so there must be a reconsideration of the appropriateness of the intervention and work done to try to identify an, an, an additional alternative that might be more suitable or appropriate for where that person is in their change process. Um, so this really moves us more towards individualized treatment. I also wanted to just address really quickly one of the questions in the chat about starting this initiative. So I, I can talk briefly about my experience with treatment at Joe, and of course I've been around, you know, very much almost since we started to go public with the bill. I wasn't around during the drafting of the bill. So I know Andrea was, was more involved on, on that end of things, but it was reaching out to who might be interested parties with this bill. You know, it started with, I believe some public defenders who got together primarily, who, you know, saw some issues to be addressed with the procedural justice side of this. Um, of course that expanded out into court social workers and then um, got incorporated into the broader, we have a strategic roadmap for justice reform here in New York State, 
and that's been spearheaded by the Center for Community Alternatives, working with the Catal Center for Justice and a number of other stakeholders in a diverse coalition. And so it's about reaching out to who would be the, the directly impacted parties, you know, the public defender's offices, the court social workers, the clinical treatment providers in the community, the disability justice groups in your community, the mental health advocates in your community, the peer advocates in your community, people who are alumni or graduates or current participants of drug courts, or people who are currently or formerly incarcerated, as well as people from communities of color or other directly impacted populations, just as a list of places to consider where to start. And we're happy to seed out materials about what we have, our one pagers or other information about the bill to kind of help people get started. But it starts with having conversations and sharing information and then setting a time and a place to convene a working group and start to see who wants to gather around this and start to temp check some of the interest in your community. You could even do a, a public listening session or a town hall where you invite people to come and talk about their experiences with these issues to try to raise some awareness and to build some motivation to develop a coalition. Um, but I, I definitely strongly recommend trying to build as diverse of a stakeholdership as you can, because that's really what's been the strength of our effort is you know, having attorneys working side by side with social workers and people who are clients or former clients or people who are formerly incarcerated or, or program participants or graduates are all directly involved in this effort, are meeting with legislators, are sharing their stories. And it's because we're doing this together that we've been able to get the progress that we have done this year on the bill. And we're very hopeful that we're gonna see more progress next year and hopefully get this passed. Andrea, did I leave anything out? Well, I just wanna add one more thing and I know we're just about at time, but um, you know, one of the folks who is a leader in this coalition is a public defender in Ontario County, which is a small red county in upstate New York. Um, and she actually about 10 years ago, you know, was working in the court system was like, this is really broken. We have a drug treatment court because of this law that passed in 2009. Like, let's just expand it and let's just do a mental health treatment court there. So rather than like trying to take on a whole legislative campaign, that wasn't something that she had the expertise um, or knowledge to do. She was like, let me just start super local. Let me start in my community. We know that we have a ton of clients who have mental health issues. We have a drug court. They're like, what if we just like use the same court? So what they did in that very small county where there aren't a lot of resources, they said, let's do, they already were doing drug court on Friday mornings. They're like, let's just stay into the afternoon and we'll do mental health treatment court in the afternoon. Because it's such a small county that the treatment providers are the same anyway. You know, it's like one program or like two programs that serve people in that county. And so they got together just the stakeholders in that county. And she lives in a very red county, conservative, rural. You know, this was not a county that, you know, is adopting harm reduction and like all of these other models. But I think if you sometimes just start really hyper local, you know, we have a big campaign, we have a big state, we have, you know, some resources, people like me who are like professional lobbyists who can, who can work on this stuff, you know, and dedicate a lot of time to it. But you don't have to have that, you know, like you can just be in a small red county and start talking to other people and say, hey, are there ways we could make this better? Like, I know we don't have any resources. They had zero dollars, right? They, they, they had no, nothing new coming in. And yet over time, like they were able to say, okay, let's use our existing resources. We're just going to do it afternoon in the same court. It's the same people anyway. Like, and now they're able to get a grant from the state judiciary for a full-time, you know, court person to work there. Like, you can build it out slowly. You don't have to say, like, I'm going to la launch this statewide campaign and try to get a bill passed with the legislature. So if you want to talk to uh, Leanne, who's, who's in that county and um, are interested in that, please feel free to reach out. Our emails are here, and I'll leave it there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I hope you had a chance to uh, just look in the chat box. There are a lot of comments and questions throughout. Um, this is clearly, you know, something that is very important for social workers to support and to get engaged on. Um, this recording will be available and we'll post it to YouTube um, and everyone who registered will receive it as well. Um, 
I just want to thank, um, you know, Michael, Andrea, Marissa, and Pamela for joining us and sharing uh, their campaign and this information with us. Is there anything that you guys would like to, you know, say in closing, um, you know, ways that folks can contact you or um, anything else you'd like to say? Yeah, I just want to make sure that um, everyone feels free to email us. All our information's right there. And thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you again, Treatment Not Jail. And uh, hope you have a great rest of your evening. Have a good one.